about the book that is recorded for us here. Ruth chapter 1, and I'm going to read for you from verse 6 to verse 18. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 6. Then Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on a way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourself from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again and offered kiss her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, And trick me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. You remember, brothers and sisters, about the story of how Ruth ended up in the land of Moab. Here in this passage that I have read for you, you find three women in conversation. We are told in verse 7 that they were on the way to return to the land of Judah. The three women are Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, and they are Ophra and Ruth. We are told in verse 6 that they were on this journey because Naomi, in verse 6 we are told, heard that the Lord has visited his people, giving them bread. Now she was in the land of Moab at this point. She was brought there by her husband Elimelech when there was a famine in the land as we are told there in verse 1. And while in Moab, we are told in verse 4, that her two sons took wives of the women of Moab. And now at this point, as they were making their way back to the land of Judah, we are told in verse 5 that Naomi had survived her two sons and her husband. What do you mean by survive? It meant that they had died. They had died in their sins. They had died because of their disobedience to God. But God in His mercy kept her alive as well as sparing the lives of the two wives of the two sons, we are told here. Now, what lessons are we to learn from this conversation between these three women on the way back to Judah? We are told there in verse 6, that she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. 
you realize that they were making this trip back to Judah because of Naomi's faith and obedience to God. Naomi had not forgotten the Lord even though her husband had brought her far away to the land of Moab. Her years were constantly tuned to what God was doing in the land of Judah as well as what the Lord was doing elsewhere in the world. She was interested to find out where is God and what God is doing that she may, in the shortest of time, obey the Lord. I ask you, brothers and sisters, do you know what is God is doing in the world today? You know that every month, as you prepare yourself to partake the Lord's Supper, normally you will also find in the courier that you receive as you come to church, the monthly report from the Middle East Reform Fellowship, MERV, inserted there. And there in that, in that newsletter, you will find about what God is doing in countries and borders close to the gospel because of hostility from other religions. Are you interested? Do you read those reports? Are you interested when people send you emails or WhatsApp telling you about things that, that, that is happening in, in your nature or elsewhere? Are you interested in what God is doing for His people in the world today? You find that Naomi was interested. So much so that when it was possible, the earliest possible time, you find that Naomi took courage and followed her Lord called. The Lord has called her and she was on the way back to obey the Lord. The three women were engaged here in a conversation. But what kind of conversation were they talking about? They were engaged, brothers and sisters, look carefully, in a spiritual conversation. Look at what you are told there. It's a conversation about God and His relationship with them. You see there in verse 15, even to the extent of talking about their relationship with their pagan gods, you see there, that she had gone back to her people and to her gods. And also Ruth understood this spiritual conversation. You find Ruth saying that your God, my God, your people, my people. And so we conclude, brothers and sisters, that here you find a spiritual conversation taking place among these three women. This was not the first time Naomi has spoken to her daughters-in-law about the Lord. That is why as she continued on to talk about her need to go back to the land of Judah and whether they, they really understood this, the, 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 the future in front of her, whether they have really made up their mind, you realize, brothers and sisters, it was really not the first time she spoke to them about the Lord because they understood what she was talking about. Ruth actually could say, your people, my people, your God, my God. And realize, brothers and sisters, that she had always been bearing witness for the Lord to these two daughters-in-law. They understood. You realize that Naomi mentioned the Lord in her conversation. Look at verse 8. The Lord deal kindly with you. Look at verse 9. The Lord grant that you may find rest. Tell me, brothers and sisters, Naomi mentioned the Lord. Do you mention the Lord? Do you mention Christ or Jesus or the Gospel or the Bible in your conversation with your friends and family members? Do you as a Christian, habitually say, thank God, when there's a good news? Do you habitually say, praise the Lord, when something happy happens to you? Do you say, God bless you, as you bid farewell at the airport, or as you bid farewell to people who have resigned and about to leave your company to move on to another place? Is it habitual? Or you have never said things like that, spiritual words like that. Instead, you find yourself habitually saying, Ayo, choy, 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 touch wood, touch wood, touch wood. Are you more used to touching wood and choy? Do you praise the Lord and thank the Lord as a matter of habit? 
You see, brothers and sisters, Naomi mentioned the Lord. And you realize here that mentioning the Lord in your conversation with others, do you know, brothers and sisters, it is a form of evangelizing? You are actually bringing the Lord into the memory, the ears and the mind of those that you are engaging in a conversation with. By simply saying, praise the Lord, those who heard you say those words immediately will come to think about the Lord. And in the time to come, in a few moments later or a few days later, or in the future, they will come to you and say, why do you like to say praise the Lord? What do you believe? Why do you say God bless her? What do you believe? How can you say thank God when, remember that day, it was a bad day, and you say thank the Lord? What do you believe? And there you realize that you are actually preparing the way for people to hear the gospel. You bring Christ and the gospel into the minds of those you are having a conversation with. You, you are opening the door. You are making it easier in the future for them to ask you spiritual questions. You are actually turning your conversation with your friends and loved ones into a spiritual conversation by mentioning the name of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I hope you have not forgotten this. That as Christians, or at least you call yourself Christian, consider yourself a Christian, that you have this duty that from the Lord in 1 Peter, Chapter 5 and verse 15. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, you read, Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Always be ready. And that ought to be of habit to you. So I call your attention to this. That Naomi mentioned the Lord as a habit. It's so easy for her to say the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. It's so easy for her to share the Lord with others. She mentioned the Lord and I ask that you mention the Lord in your conversation. Make it easy and easier for others to talk to you about spiritual things. That is how you open the door. That is how you live a Christian life. You may not be a great Christian, you know. People know that you're not a perfect Christian. But you make it easy for them to know and to talk to you about Christ. And then you can indeed bring someone, save someone in this life by just mentioning the Lord and keeping the door open. That's the first thing, brothers and sisters. You find in this passage, you find a, a spiritual conversation taking place between three women. And I hope that you will remember to engage in spiritual conversations. The second point I want you to observe here is that you find a gospel call. A gospel call that is of the Old Testament, not the New Testament Christian type we are familiar with, but this is the Old Testament type. It's a still a gospel call. You find that Naomi had travelled a distance with Ruth and Ophir before she had this spiritual conversation with them. Isn't that what you are told there in verse 6? That's what was happening. That verse 7, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah and so they were already on the way, on the road and then sometime after that, she started to just want to make sure that the the daughters, you know, understood the significance, the purpose of this going back to Judah. You find a call from Naomi to them to count the cost. Asking them, you want to follow me to return to the Lord? But have you really understood the call? Do you know that there is a cost involved in following me? Have you counted the cost that you need to pay. Naomi reminded them that she could offer them nothing in this world. There is no prosperity gospel here. Naomi said to them actually that they would find nothing but suffering if they would follow her 
to return to the Lord, Naomi was actually telling them, I cannot offer you anything in this life if you wanted to follow me to obey the Lord. But I cannot guarantee you anything at all. Are you still sure that you want to follow me to follow the Lord? Then she said this in verse 11. Are there still sons in my womb? That they may be your husbands? Well, Naomi was referring to an ancient <coughs> custom recorded for us in Deuteronomy 25, <coughs> verse 5 to verse 10, where if a Jewish or an Israelite husband died, his brother or a near relative has the duty to marry the widow in order to continue the brother's name. But Naomi was saying to them that she did not have any more son to marry Ruth and offer. She had, at this point in time, forgotten about Boaz. And so she thought that she had nobody, no near of skin, no relative that would be willing to help her because she was in the first place a widow and poor. And so she was actually telling them, consider this carefully. You really want to go back with me? I'm obeying the law to return, but you really want to return with me? Have you considered the hopeless future of widowhood? The hopeless future of having no children? If you remain with me and if you return with me, that's your future. But if you go back to your family, go back to your mother's house, well then, then you may even get married. You may even have children of your own. So think, you follow me, I'm just a poor old widow. But if you go back, you may have the opportunities open for you back home with your people and with your God. And here we are told that Naomi mentioned this to Ruth and Orpha. But Naomi did not hide all this cost that they were called upon to think about from them. You see, brothers and sisters, it is important for you to think very clearly about your future too. If you follow your sin, your sin will bring you nothing but the wrath of God. You may think that you are smart, you may think that it will bring you happiness, but if you obey, disobey the Lord, brothers and sisters, disobedience to God will never bring lasting peace and lasting happiness. He who prepares for this life, but not for the next, is wise for a moment, but he is a fool forever. You need to seriously consider the gospel call that Jesus asked you to make. He called you to make in Luke 14 verse 28. He says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it less, after he has laid the foundation for the tower and is not able to finish it, all who see it begins to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So it is the Lord using that from construction and building a spiritual lesson for us that your relationship with God as your spiritual relationship must until the counting of cost too. Because a lot of people, they did not count the cost when they say they want to be a Christian. And then along the way, they find that, oh, it's too difficult to be a Christian. And then they just lost faith, shipwrecked, and they just lost everything. This is the gospel call that Naomi gave to Opa and Ruth. Make the commitment. Decide clearly. Is it worthwhile to obey Jesus? Is Jesus really worth it? Is the promise that Jesus made to you really worth it and really true? Are you ready to sacrifice your life to trust in the promises that Jesus made? Jesus made this promise. If you obey me and trust in me, I will give you the new heaven and the new earth if you repent and turn away from your sin. Are you willing to turn from your sin? Will the cost of turning from your sin be too high for you? Or is Jesus worth whatever cost? You see, 
That is the Christian life. The Christian always stand at a point in time where the Christian need to count the cost and see if you really will remain true to God. You remember Joshua? At the end of his life, he said this to the people of God in ancient time. In Joshua 24 and verse 15. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So you had to choose. Before he asked them to choose, he told them exactly what God has promised. And at the same time, warned them of the cost involved. If you are not willing to pay the spiritual cost, you will not have God as your God. But as for me and my house, we have decided, Joshua said, we think, we have decided it is worthwhile, we remain with the Lord. The same thing happened in the days of the prophet Elijah. Remember on Mount, on a mountain in 1 Kings 18 verse 21, Elijah called on the people, how long will you halt? Will you falter between two options? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal is God, then follow Baal. Don't be standing on a fence. You have to make a clear decision. Will you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or will you not? Is believing the Lord Jesus Christ worth the sacrifice you are going to make? Jesus says, He who loves father or mother more than me, is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Count the cost, brothers and sisters. Have you counted the cost? If your son or daughter will not obey the Lord, you obey the Lord. You have to give up your son and your daughter. You cannot say that I love my son, my daughter so much that I'm not willing to give them up. Jesus said, if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of it. Count your cause, brothers and sisters. That's what the Lord is calling you. Is your sin so important? You are addicted to pornography. You are addicted to stealing. You are addicted to telling lies. You are covetous. You are wicked. You gossip. You say bad things about people and all. You are so wicked, so wicked, so wicked. Will you continue to be in that way or will you do everything you can that you from now on will only show the loveliness of Jesus Christ in your life. You have to decide. You cannot say, I want to serve sin, and yet I want to go to heaven. You cannot have both brothers and sisters, because sin will bring you and drag you down to hell. Only if you repent and cling on to the Lord Jesus Christ in obedience, will He bring you to heaven. This is the gospel call. Turn away from your sin, your old sinful habits. Sinful habits, sinful <laughs> way of life. Be teachable. Let Jesus be your teacher. And then, brothers and sisters, you will be at peace with God. That's the second call. It's a call to the daughter-in-laws. Will you, will you, will you know the cause? Will you really obey? Obey the Lord. Will you really have the Lord as your God? and serve Him and Him only. Well, we are told, brothers and sisters, now on the third and last point, you find here a true comfort. Naomi spoke the same message as you can see here. The same message was given to Ofa and Ruth. Same call, gospel call to decide. And yet, after considering the situation, we find that one of them, Ofa, wept, we are told in verse 14, Kiss her mother-in-law, in verse 15, gone back to her people and to her gods. But Ruth, we are told, decided to follow Naomi in order that she can return with Naomi to the Lord. Look at what we are told there in verse 16. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. 
For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. You see that there is there is God involved in this conversation. It is not about just human relationship. Oh, Ruth. Ruth is such a nice daughter-in-law. You know, she couldn't give up her responsibility to to this mother-in-law. She felt in her duty. No, 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 brothers and sisters. It is not about human relationship. It is about following the mother-in-law because the mother-in-law is following God, and she has come to believe in the mother-in-law's God. She has become a believer of the mother-in-law's religion. Ruth understood what Naomi was saying. Ruth understood the warning, the gospel call that she has made to the to her about a hopeless, a apparent hopeless future. Yet, despite all this, look, you find Ruth taking the hand of Naomi and returning with her to the Lord. There is something spiritual about this decision. It is not about somebody who is so crazy. I choose to be poor. I choose to be a widow. I choose to suffer in a foreign land. No, brothers and sisters, nobody is so silly. And Ruth wasn't a silly woman. She understood, but she also understood that there, even if she dies, she would rather die with God in God's land rather than to go back and die without God and in a pagan land. You understand? She wants, above all, to die with God. Ruth believed in the promise of God that Naomi had shared with her all this time. Ruth had not seen the promises yet. In our day and age, we are always demanded by people who are the people we describe as seeing is believing. They only believe if they can see it. And I want you now to turn your attention to the Gospel of John, to seeing is believing mentality. What do you learn there in uh, John, Gospel of John chapter 20? We find an example of seeing is believing. It's not, it's not something new. It was already in the Bible. There are people who were like that. And so we are told in John chapter 20, verse 25, a disciple by the name of Thomas, he said in verse 25, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I <coughs> will not believe. In other words, if I don't see it, I don't believe. Don't, don't be ridiculous. Don't ask me to, to believe in something that I, I have not seen. And the day came when Jesus met with him in verse 29. Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Ruth is another example of somebody who heard about the promises of God through the mother-in-law and she believed. She thought about it and she said, I believe. I wonder whether you too believe, brothers and sisters. There was another man who did not see Jesus Christ, who lived long before Jesus was born and yet he believed in God's promise that Jesus will be born and Jesus is coming. In Hebrews 11, verse 24 to verse 26, you read about Moses. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, and listen here, esteeming the reproach or the, the shame, the suffering of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Moses, he could see the treasures of Egypt, 
Moses, he could be the next Pharaoh. And yet, he looked at the treasures of Egypt and he looked at the throne, the power that he could, he could assume and he told himself, but I believe in Christ more. I love the kingdom of Jesus Christ far beyond what Egypt can offer me. Brothers and sisters, I wonder how many of you are like that. I think the devil will find it very easy to tempt you. Give you a few sum of money, you will fall and worship him. But not Moses. Satan will find it very hard to tempt Moses. Because Moses is committed. He counted the cost and he is a true, a true convert of God, you see. The future of proof clearly teaches you, brothers and sisters. That God will never fail His people. I have been young and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants, his descendants begging bread. Psalm 37 and verse 25. In church history, you find a Christian by the name of Polycarp. Polycarp was a leader in the early church. In fact, he was the direct disciple of the Apostle John. Polycarp was arrested when he was an old man by the Roman authorities and he was sentenced to be burned at a stake for being a Christian. The Roman officer in charge of him looked at this old man and took pity on him and urge him to recant. All Polycarp had to do, the Roman soldier told him, has, was to say, Caesar is low, and offer a little bit of incense to a statue, an idol of Caesar, and then the, the Roman authority will forgive him and let him leave. Instead, Polycarp's report, response was this. 86 years I have served Christ and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Polycarp was taken to the place of execution and he was killed for being a Christian. Polycarp understood The cost involved. What you see, brothers and sisters, Polycarp saw that Stephen in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the glory of Jesus Christ. He saw the world to come to be better than this world that is about to end. For him, anyway, he's an old man, and for every one of us, we will end one day too. And he trusted in the promise of Jesus Christ that, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. You know, there was another man in the Bible who did not see the glory of Jesus Christ, but only his suffering. You remember the thief on the cross? Hey, I'm here suffering about the night. Hey, Jesus, you are there. You are also suffering, and like me, you are about to die. And yet one of the two thieves believed in what he has heard about the promises of Jesus Christ. He turned to the Lord in Luke 23 and verse 42. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. People will look at him and say, Are you stupid or what? You are trusting your life to somebody who is about to die together with you. But he consider Jesus to be different from him because he said, I am a sinner, I am a criminal, I deserve to die, but not him. I believe in him. And Jesus did not fail him because Jesus responded by saying, today, today, not tomorrow, not in the future, not maybe, you know, today, for sure, Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise. <laughs> See, brothers and sisters, this world can never buy his heart. But can this world buy your heart? 
Would you rather give up God because of money? Give up God because of somebody you see? You are not supposed to love. Will you give up God because of your sin, your addiction? No, 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 not for this team. Not for Polycarp. Not for Moses. And I hope that you will be like Ruth. Ruth followed Naomi to return to the Lord. It wasn't a very easy job. <coughs> Next week you will find that she faced racial discrimination. From then on, she was known as Ru the Moabitess. It's a term, a derogative. It's a, it's a very, very bad racist term. She has to suffer all these things. She showed her it all. She suffered them all. She was separated from her own father and mother, from her own people. She had to learn a new language, a new custom, a new way of living. But she was willing to accept all this, all because she was willing to accept any suffering she has to make because of God. What are you willing to do? And what has God called you to sacrifice and suffer for Him? Are you willing to suffer as a Christian? 86 years I have served Christ and He never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my King who saved me from my sin? Oh, brothers and sisters, Polly can't say that. Will you be able to say that? When people look at your life, the choices, that you make in your life, will they see a person who has already counted a cause, who is willing to do anything in order to obey the Lord? I trust, my beloved brothers and sisters, that the lesson you learn from these three women in conversation will be this. Christ is worth it. I want Christ to be in my marriage. I want Christ to be in my family. I want Christ to be in my job. I want Christ to be in my life. I want Christ to be in my friendship. I want Christ to be in my home. I want Christ to be in my church, the church I belong to. I want Christ and Him crucified. May you find Christ when you come to realize His worth it. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my friend from day to day. Without Him, I would fall. And may that be true. Let's pray to you.